I'd love to get your gut reaction to that. Um, I watched it at the Sunday Times office on my own, you know, third story of building, not expecting this. And my feeling was, um, Lance, I don't need an apology. I really, I'm not that bothered if you do or don't. If you do, I, I would accept it graciously. But, you know, I, I would far rather uh, have the chance to interview him and ask him a lot of questions because even though that interview was very interesting, a lot of stuff remained unanswered. Critically, uh, critical questions that you found needed to be answered were among them, for example. Well, I mean, he, a lot of people enabled him to do what he did. So and he, he didn't speak about those people. You should have named names. Yes, he should, very okay. much so. What else bothered you about the interview? Um, I just thought his apologies weren't heartfelt. I, I watched him and I thought, this guy knows intellectually that he has got to be remorseful. But emotionally, he couldn't do it. Did, he, he couldn't actually seem like he meant it. Did you think he looked like somebody who was remorseful? No. No, I didn't. I, I think he knew he had to be. He wanted to be. But it's he like, couldn't muster up the ability to actually do couldn't it. Couldn't do it emotionally. Couldn't do it. It's like, it's like you, you know, a person goes to a funeral and a loved one has passed away and they want to grieve, but emotionally they can't do it. And, and, and in that respect, I felt a certain sympathy for him. I just thought, you know, he knows what he has to do and emotionally he can't go there. He had a particular... I don't want to read too much into the superficial, but he had a kind of look on this yeah. about him, didn't he? I mean, uh, Oprah would ask him a question and the answer that he was going to give was going to diminish him in the eyes because he was making an, an admission of something, yeah. whether it was the bullying of Emma or whatever. And just before he gave the answer, you could see a smirk just flash across his face. And you thought, did I just, did, I, did that guy smirk there? And he did. And he didn't want to do that. It was like an involuntary reaction, tick. reflex, tick. And, and obviously the guy has got kind of personality issues, but Emma would have a better idea because she knew him and lived inside the team with him. And I'm going to come to him in a sec, but I, I just want to finish a, a few points as we open the interview with you, if I may, David, because I'd like to know when you were watching it, as you say, alone in, in the office. Did you, did you think, you, you talk about his, his incapability to muster some class of humility, if you like, but, or remorse, but did you think he was sorry? Um, I think he was sorry he got caught. Well, that's very different to the yeah. question I'm asking. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, at, um, at different points in the interview, he, he said at one point, he yeah. said, if I hadn't made my comeback, remember, he retired in 2005, he came back in 2009. And he said in the interview, he said, you know, if I hadn't made my comeback, we wouldn't be sitting here. In other words, I wouldn't have got caught and I would never have admitted it. He said at another point he had his $75 million day yes. when he lost $75 million in endorsements. And you're thinking, Lance, we're not interested in how much money you lost. We're interested in the way you cheated. We're interested in the people you, you, you bulldozed and yeah. bullied. That's what we want to hear you talking about, not what you've lost. He described himself, and excuse my language, but he did describe himself as being an arrogant prick. Was he right in that assessment? Um, he was certainly ruthless and he was certainly um, uncaring in terms of the damage he caused in other people's yeah. lives and that's, that's Is that I'm a saying. polite way of saying what he said? You mean, well, I would say... I he's trying a... to say he's more than that. What were you going <laughs> to say, Emma? I think David's trying to say he's more than an arrogant Pete, do you know what I mean? What do you think he is? See, I'm still torn, really, because I... And one of my ways I got through it all was okay. to remember the nice lance that I worked Let, with. We'll, we'll do that in a second. But, and, I, and I do want to do that because it's not about beating someone up either. But, mm. I, I, but I would like to talk about the interview because it's still fresh in the minds of people. You watched it, I presume. I watched the first one. The first one? Yeah. And what did you make of it? Well, obviously, and in all fairness, I loved the start. I loved the yes, no answers. Yeah. And that stunned me that he just, instead of waffling or instead of I've had 500 tests or instead of talking like a politician, he spoke straight and said yes or no. Right. And that was a huge revelation. It kind of went downhill from there. Do you know what I mean? What did you make of the body language and the smirk? And the sneer and the thing. It was like, oh, Lance, you needed more practice. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He was like, Lance, maybe I should have put something in your eyes to make him a bit weepy or something. But... <laughs> did, did you think he was contrite? Do you think he was sorry? I think, he, again, he's sorry he got caught and he's sorry he can't compete. Two very different things to... But he's not sorry. You, I, you don't you think can, so? Not at all. No. no, that wasn't the body language, the, the 
verbal language, anything of a contrite man. It was a, the language of a man who's lost $75 million in one day. I have to use more I'm afraid, profanities, unfortunately, because this, the, the reason you're, you're involved in the story is because he referred to you at one point of being an alcoholic whore. And, you know, when you heard that coming out of a man, you were his... Uh, you, you, how, how would you describe what you were to him in his... Well, we, the thing is with Lance and I, we actually did have a really good relationship. As... And even other people, other cyclists on the team, other people who knew him kind of goes, would say I got away with much more than people did get away with, because if he was having a bad day, I'd tell him he was having a bad so day. So you, you had a good working relationship, good, two straight shooters straight calling up. Yeah, exactly. So when he said that, what did you think when he said it the first but time? You, it's only now that he's actually kind of it's starting to come out that I wasn't lying. It's only, and that's why in the interview, for me, when he said, well, Emma got rolled over, got rolled over as she was, well, that was, that was like, and I, you know me, I'm not emotional, but that was a really emotional moment. Why? Because he actually told the truth there. Do you know what I mean? That I was one of those that got yeah. bullied and pushed over and I, and I had been telling the truth. For him to actually go and tell the world that I was telling the truth, it was only then did I realise how much it had actually hurt me, him calling me the alcoholic. Whatever, Whatever I want, yeah, yeah. Have to say it again. But uh, can I just ask you one minute before, David? I'm happy yeah. to come back to you in a moment, but if I may have... Um, he said in the interview with Oprah uh, Winfrey that he, he had attempted to reach out to you. Uh, what did that mean in reality? In reality, he phoned me, but it was a missed call. OK. And then sent me a text... Saying? Saying, Emma, it's Lance, will you give me a call, please? Thanks. And you thought when you read that? Well, one, the please and thanks, I thought, he's really in trouble. <laughs> if, it is, if it is him, and two, I was going to send him a jokey text back on, this can't be Lance, Lance only gets in touch with me through his lawyers. Because <laughs> <laughs> he did try to... He, did he sue you? He sued for... about, well, myself and David has named defendants for a million pounds. But one thing I have to say too, that's when I got the text, because I kind of, my coverage at home is quite bad. And so I'd seen the missed call that night and then the following morning when I went into work, I noticed the text. Yeah. And I was talking to someone at work and so I saw the text and finished off the conversation I was having. And then went into my room and it was only then, it's, it hit me, that was my USADA moment. Remember you asked yes. me, kind of when the USADA report came out, David said, well, how did it make you feel? Yes. It was still really flat, it was really anticlimactic, but getting that text, that's when I realised just how much he had hurt and he had wounded me. It just... By calling of, those yeah. names, do you know what I mean? And especially because Lance and I would have conversations. And at the time when I was in cycling, it was mainly men and less women. Yes. So supply and demand meant I could have had a good time, kind of. And uh, I'd behave. You know, we would have conversations like this over the massage table, and we'd be both puritanical moralists, kind of giving <laughs> the massage. Yeah, how good are we? And for him to attack me in that way, that really, really hurt. But it's only in the past week have I realised just how much. Emma, what would it you say to him me. if you're sitting beside you? At the moment, you know what? I probably wouldn't say much. Yeah. You know, I'd probably be moving over this end, just because. It's only made me realise now this week, I'm still licking my wounds and stuff. I'm still not ready to talk to him. But if he said to you, I am sorry to your face, what would you say to him? He would have, there'd have to be no TV cameras anywhere. And there'd have to be no, do you know what I mean? Why? Before I'd even, TV camera, it's just Lance trying to show remorse to the world. Do you know what I mean? It's just more of a publicity stunt. Yeah. Was it a little early for him to do an interview of this nature, do you think? Yeah, no question. Yeah. And in, what, in what sense? In the sense that he, he, he told, if you were following tweets that he sent out, say, three weeks before the interview, yeah. he was, in his mind, he was the wronged one, that he's been scapegoated in all of this. But just before considering that, yes, Ryan, yes. Um, the thing, Em and I are sitting here now, we've always been good friends since we did our interview in July 2003. Mm -hmm. But people will look at us now and they will have no idea of how stressful it was at the time. And um, I, I mean, when you're Emma O'Reilly and you've given an interview to a journalist and you've told the truth, Yes. And then you've got a guy who, in his first press conference about it, he said, he was asked, well, what about what Emma O'Reilly said? And this is what this guy said. He said, well, with Emma, you know, there were issues with Emma, uh, issues involving uh, members of the team management and issues involving uh, riders. And Emma had to leave the team. Now, basically, what he was saying... What was he implying? It was, he was implying that Emma had had improper relationships with members of the team management and members... And this is a woman who's earning her living as a, as a, as a physical therapist. What and had Emma said that had upset him so, for those who have, aren't in the yeah, know in the cycling business? I mean, basically, 
I believed Lance was doping from the, yeah. from the moment he won his first tour. I was trying to get you know, people that would help me, give me the information. I got in touch with Emma. She said she was prepared to do an interview. I went up and I spoke to Emma about doing the interview. Yeah. We did the interview, seven hours, and Emma told me everything that happened in the team, basically. I kind of thought if I'm going to speak to a journalist, I'd prefer to, because uh, I'd been approached for ye the years that I left cycling. It was about three and a half years I'd left cycling yeah. when I spoke to David. Yeah. And I thought, David's a good journalist. He knows what he's talking about. He writes for a reputable paper. If I am going to do an interview, I will do it 110%. But the interview I gave to David wasn't just about Lance, it was about the drugs in the sport. Yeah. It was about what it was doing to these young lads. Yeah. And that's what my interview to David was. And, and when did you, as you know, in your role, realise, as you looked around, this isn't good, I don't like what I'm seeing? What was your, your, your tipping point? You know, point? I think my very, very first time, my tipping point was kind of from the get-go, because from the get-go, okay. I never, ever got involved in the drugs in the sport, because I never agreed with them. So I worked in the sport, but as a, my role was a swan yard, it's a massage, you do the first aid, you do yeah. the nutrition. But traditionally, the swan yard has also administered the medical programme, okay. which is the drugs in it. And I had never, ever got involved with that. Now, I managed to get away with it through a bit of sheer luck. And I think the fact, too, I was the girl. And so we leave the girl out of it. Kind I of. left you alone. Yeah. yeah. But I remember at um, Pied Bay was probably the first time I realised there's something going on. And then after we finished the first Tour de France, a mechanic from a different team said, you've got some doctor. And I'm like, oh. Because he finished with nine riders in the tour. That's some good doctor you've got. And it was only then I thought, yeah, there is something going on. And what sort of things did you do to <clears throat> facilitate drug taking and cycling? You see, the fun thing is I did very, very, very little but to the facilitate. Bits, the, but the bits you did, just... just Getting to... rid of syringes, um, picking up something for a rider, you know, and yeah. bringing up... Um, picking up something for Lance, kind of... But mostly kind of getting rid of syringes. And, and, and you, you were saying, I mean, but even to, to me as a, as a kind of casual sports fan, hearing you yeah. saying, I was just collecting <laughs> syringes, like, what, what? You know, I mean, I know this has been your world, but mm. for, for, the, for the innocents yeah. who hoped that it was just you get on your bike, you pump the wheels and you go for a cycle. You know what I mean? Obviously, I'm yeah. being a bit glib about yeah. it. But, yeah. but did, was it this that led you to quit? Was it a moment of, 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 of righteousness? In, in, no, and I mean that I'd, in a I'd, benign I'd, way. I'd always said, when I turn 30, I'm getting out of this. Okay, so it was a But time. one of the reasons I knew I couldn't stay in it. If you stay in it, you're going to have to start yeah. getting involved yeah. in it. You can't stay in it and not. You, 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 were, you, were, you were friendly with Lance Armstrong. We have a picture of you yeah. with, with Lance Armstrong. I mean, yeah. you got on well. What, what, would, what sort of per person was he? When times are good, how would you describe well, you him? you see, Lance and I did get on. That's why I kind of... The, the, the Lance I saw in Oprah was the Lance that everybody else talks about. Yeah. But the Lance that I worked with, yeah. we did get on really well. Like, like Lance Pleasant. during the winter. Dead pleasant. Funny. Had me, told me to stay in his place in Nice. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Fabulous house in Nice. Here, listen, I'll get so and so who will open the gates for you, and it's yours for the winter then. Yeah. The lance that I spoke to and kind of hung out with was um, the guy who I was telling him about somebody who had a Rolex watch, and I was thinking of getting a new watch, and da 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 da. A week later, I got a Rolex watch from him. Do you know what I mean? For so winning there's the a side tour. to him that was. Lovely. Generous the lance, and... when Johan, the director, tried to fire me one time, Lance stepped in and sorted it. So, David, how did Emma become so important to your pursuit of this story? Because um, I, I'd spoken to a few people who'd given me little nuggets of information. Yes. But I hadn't actually interviewed anybody who'd worked in the team. And Emma had not only worked in the team for a five year period, yeah. but she, Two of those years, she was personal masseuse to the main man, the guy that most concerned me. Because it, it wasn't, people say, well, why do you focus on Lance? Because Lance was this cancer icon. He had won the Tour de France, he kept winning the Tour de France. So if he was doping, he, he was leading the sport down a particular road. And I was convinced he was doping. And suddenly I meet this woman who's been in the team for five years, and she's just totally honest about her experience. And the thing that was amazing about the arrogance of um, Armstrong and his team. Yes. That Emma was badly treated by the team manager, Johan Berniel, in her final year. Mm -hmm. And yet they presumed that Emma would go away with all the secrets of the team and just keep those secrets forevermore. Now, Emma didn't do that. She gave me this extraordinary interview. As a journalist, of course, this is my Christmas. I think th uh, definitely in my life, this was the most revealing yeah. interview I would ever get. We, I wrote a book with Pierre Ballester, a French journalist, LA Confidential, The Secrets yes. of Lance Armstrong. The Emma chapter was 23,000 words long. Which tells its own story. Which tells its you, own 13 story. 13 years in pursuit of the story. Um, 
and, and again, without wanting to sound judgmental, but was it, was it an obsession for you or was it journalistic diligence? I, both, maybe. Was it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, it was, no, it was an obsession, sorry. I shouldn't even <laughs> deliberate over the question. I mean, you're because, laughing. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be, I remember being, going to the Gulf in Augusta, right? Yeah. And I'm, I get on the American side and I'm, I have to, you have to put your stuff through X-ray machine again. And there's a guy alongside of me wearing a dark suit, very nice guy, young guy, open neck shirt, very well dressed, briefcase, everything looks good. And he's got a yellow wristband, a uh, lift strong wristband on. And he's Is that a, a Lance Armstrong, Lance Armstrong supporters yeah, wristband? Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, okay. this whole lady million of them, whatever. Yes. And I, I'm standing out to this guy, I've never met him in my life, I've never seen him. And I, I point down at his wristband and I say, You know that guy's a fraud. And the guy looks at me, he says, What? I said, Lance Armstrong, I said he cheats to win the Tour de France. Mm. And the guy said, what makes you think that? And I said, well, I'm a journalist and I've done some investigations. I know he cheats. Yeah. And the guy just picked up, he had left his briefcase down, he just picked up his briefcase and he went back in the queue, which like put himself back in the queue to get away from me yeah. because he thought I was completely <laughs> insane. Yeah. Yeah. It got quite, it, it, no, it didn't get quite, it got very vindictive between Armstrong and you. Yeah. He brought it right home to where it's going to hurt you most. Yeah. Can you share that with us? Yeah, I mean, he used to call me stuff like, he would, Lance would say, uh, David Welch is the worst journalist. He told another yeah. journalist, David Welch is the worst journalist I ever know. No ethics, no morals. He would lie, he would cheat, he would yeah. do anything to bring me down. Which is ironic coming from Lance, in all fairness. Yeah, yeah. yeah. bizarre. You know what I mean? That's right. But he took, he took uh, it uh, and to then, another level. And then he, he really became obsessed with me. And a guy called Daniel Coyle was, was writing a book. And Daniel Coyle took, took, an, uh, um, took the manuscript to Lance and said, you know, you've got to read this now, yes. Lance, if you want to. Mm -hmm. And Lance said, is there anything in this book I'm not going to like? And uh, Daniel Coyle said, no, 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 it's fine. And Lance said, it's Walsh, isn't it? You're going to describe him in this book as the bloody award-winning journalist. And Daniel Coyle could feel something coming. He said, Lance, he said, this guy, you know, he, he lost his son in, a, in an accident off his bicycle. And, uh, you know, he said, he's not a bad guy. And Lance said, Oh yeah, that's, that's a favourite son. And, he, and Lance discussed my relationship with John, who was our son, who died at the age of 12 off his bike. And Lance said, it was sick that I should ever have described our 12-year-old son as a favourite son. And, and that was the one thing that really struck home to me. It, it made me, um, it just made me think, oh God, what are we getting into here? Yeah. And then he subsequently said, he said that, um, he said, I had a vendetta against cycling. That you had. That I had a vendetta against cycling and a vendetta against Lance Armstrong. He told all his teammates this. And the reason I had a vendetta was because our son was killed off his bicycle. And I, again, when that, the, his teammates, his own teammate, Lance's teammates told me, came to me and said, this is what Lance says about you. And you say? Oh, I just, well, I didn't know what to say, to be honest. But that was a low yeah. thing to go after him being, because that oh, makes it very personal. And it also then drags all of David's family back in. Yeah opens a wound that's never, ever, ever going you, to be fixed. But equally, and to, sorry, go ahead. Well, obviously, kind of, David, because with us being sued, with all the way, the, the pressures I wear on, you kind of needed your family support. Yeah. yeah. And then to dr make it raw for them as yeah. well, it was just, that was low. Yeah. You've, you, we've talked about the, the chances of getting an apology, and you said you'd rather an interview than uh, to an apology. Uh, is that a possibility at all? Yes, it is a possibility. Is it? Yeah, it is a possibility, I would say. I mean, um, How close the Sunday are you Times. To it? Well, the Sunday Times basically have sued Lance because he sued us. We had to pay money to stop the case. Yes. Because London, UK libel laws were going to allow him to win. Okay. It cost us about £900,000. We're looking for that money back. Um, we're in negotiations. Cut a deal. To cut a deal. And there's no question that uh, um, part of Lance's strategy in this and his legal people would be to say, look, you know, well, what would happen if we gave David first interview after Oprah? That, now that could be the next step. Yeah. Now, my attitude would be, if you were to do a proper interview, not like the interview, interview you did with Oprah, <laughs> but an interview where you would answer questions honestly and at length yeah. and you would get the follow-up questions, well, then I'd be interested. OK, because you, you, you put a letter, didn't you, an open letter into the Chicago Tribune yeah. saying these are the questions that should yes. be asked. And I presume they, they, that would make up yeah. most of your, the start of your interview. Yeah. Um, could I ask Emmett, just sorry to, yeah. but very quickly, because of the time we have left, 
You were dragged in. I mentioned you were sued. Yeah. Um, and I, I get the impression that you're quite a private person. I know you're here tonight because it's yeah. such a big story in your life. Yeah. But did, did, it, did it hurt you when you were brought through the mill very publicly like that for your family? You're from, are you from Tallaght originally yeah. in Ireland? Yeah, uh, I mean, did, how did that go down at home? You know, I didn't. What I, one of my ways of dealing with it yeah. was I didn't tell many people about it. And partly, I kind of half felt I deserved it because I had told... In cycling, you don't tell what's going on. And I had told David, and then obviously David had written the book and all that. So I felt ashamed for having broken the cycling rules. I felt ashamed for what I was being called. Sure. And then, so I kind of tried, only the people very, very close to me, like really close yeah. to me. So most of my extended family back here wouldn't have known. Now my brother, but he lives in New York, yeah. he knew. And he was, he was ferocious in his support of me. And you kept the hedge yourself then. And so I just, yeah, I just, and it was one of my ways of coping. Because I thought if I start, letting it into my life and telling more people to I'll never escape it and, and then it's been constantly reminded that basically you're an alcoholic prostitute you're you know yeah. how's it going <laughs> yeah. but so I didn't I just tried to keep it quiet okay. you know because I was ashamed and too I was trying to build a business too I couldn't you relieved this week yeah actually this week yeah. now and there's the same problem this week I was emotional like Saturday I just took to my bed good I yeah. just couldn't just let deal it with out. anything. Yeah, David, no, it's a good, 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 a good week, a relief. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm really thrilled for Emma, God. for Betsy, Andrea, all the sources. They're the people who told the truth for the sake. Yeah. Always remember, Ryan. I was a journalist. I was being paid to do this. It was, sure. it was my job. But it was vindication for the innocence around you. Absolutely, yeah. the people who would. Yeah. Well, David, well, if I could say well done, I think it's probably not the right word, but uh, you were dogged in your pursuit, and I think it's been an interesting couple of weeks to say the least. And um, I'm glad to say vindication is a word that comes to mind likely tonight, and that's a good news story for you both. So well done. David Walsh and Emma O'Reilly, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you both.